This presentation provides an overview of the principles of the three R's. That is the replacement, reduction and refinement of animals in research. It also introduces the NC3Rs, an organisation established to support scientists and others to implement the three R's. The principles of the three R's were originally developed as a framework for humane animal research. Replacement refers to methods that avoid or replace the use of animals. Where animals continue to be required, reduction refers to methods that minimise the number of animals used per study while maintaining robust experimental design. And refinement refers to methods that minimise pain, suffering and distress and improve animal welfare. The three R's are important for various reasons. They promote high quality science by encouraging scientists to carefully scrutinise their choice of model and use the latest science and technology. They also help to increase efficiency and standards in the use and care of research animals. Many funding bodies, learned societies and research institutions include the three R's in their policies and practices. Using animals in research raises ethical concerns because of the pain and suffering that can be caused and the three R's provide a framework for addressing this. The three R's are also embedded in national and international legislation and regulations for example, in those that govern the use of animals in scientific procedures and international guidelines for the testing of pharmaceuticals and chemicals. This is because public opinion polls consistently show that support for animal research is dependent on implementation of the three R's. We will now explore each of the R's in further detail. Replacement refers to methods that directly replace or avoid the use of vertebrate animals in experiments where they would otherwise have been used. Animal models can be costly and time consuming and depending on the research question can have scientific limitations, for example poor relevance to human biology. The NC3Rs divides replacement into two categories, full and partial replacement. Full replacement avoids the use of any animals. It includes the use of human tissues and cells, established cell lines, mathematical and in silico models, and human volunteers. Partial replacement includes the use of animals which, based on current scientific thinking, are not considered capable of experiencing suffering. This includes invertebrates and other lower organisms, and early life forms of vertebrate species. Partial replacement also includes the use of primary cells and tissues taken from animals killed solely for this purpose. In the following case study, Professor Paul Kay describes how the development of an in silico model is replacing mouse infection studies in his research on leishmaniasis, as well as helping to identify new scientific opportunities and accelerate the testing of potential therapeutics. So we work on the neglected tropical disease leishmaniasis and this is a protozoan infection that affects about 2 million people every year and can cause either long-lasting scars to the skin where lesions have appeared or can affect the internal organs causing the fatal disease visceral leishmaniasis or calorazar. So to study leishmaniasis and to understand the mechanisms of the disease and how we can develop new vaccines and drugs We've used a combination of human experimental approaches, but also work in animal models, particularly in mice. What we've been doing over the last few years is to collect huge amounts of data from these animal models and really probably haven't mined it as successfully as we could. And so we started a collaboration about six years ago with John Timmis at York to develop computational tools which would allow us to build simulations, if you like computer games, that allow us to see how the immune response behaves under different conditions and how when we introduce different drugs or vaccines, we might change that behavior for the benefit of protecting those animals from disease. To put this in context, to do a normal preclinical study of, an animal, of a drug or an immune modifier in this model would need somewhere between 50 and 100 mice, all at moderate severity on a home office license. What we can do with our simulations now is to run many hundreds or thousands of combinations, manipulating individual cells, manipulating individual arms of the immune response, or manipulating those using drugs or vaccines. 
And this gives us a prediction which allows us to at least down-select those experiments that need to go forward into final animal testing. The replacement aspects of this is therefore quite significant, and we estimated uh, when we started this project that possibly up to 40,000 animals a year were being used worldwide in leishmaniasis research for preclinical testing of this nature, and we think we can make a significant reduction in the number of animals that would be needed for these types of studies through the simulations that we've built. So in addition to creating these models, we've decided to put them all onto the internet so they're available as open source and anyone in the research community will be able to use these models to conduct their own in silico experiments in a virtual laboratory environment. And we think this will have a major impact on reducing and replacing the number of animals uh, for these sorts of studies across the whole community worldwide. Importantly, the platforms we develop can also be used for other diseases and in fact, we're now making a similar model for sarcoidosis, a very important disease in humans, where there is very little animal data available as models don't exist. Before you begin a research project, and as the work progresses, it is important to review whether you can replace some or all of the proposed animal use. A thorough review of the literature is essential. In the past, there were relatively limited opportunities for replacement, but recent advances in fields such as stem cell biology and the use of microphysiological systems, and in silico modelling, as we've just heard, mean that replacement is now much more achievable. If a living whole organism is vital to your research, then you should consider using lower organisms such as Drosophila, nematode worms, or the social amoebae, Dictyostelium. Such organisms possess biological pathways and systems analogous to vertebrates and can have scientific advantages over other commonly used animal models. They have been used widely in biological research to study diseases from cancer to neurodegeneration and to assess the safety of pharmaceuticals and other chemicals. For the same reasons, you should also consider if you could use an embryonic or fetal form of an animal in place of its use at a protected life stage. Finally, if you only require animal tissue, you should explore if it is already available in a tissue bank or from colleagues. Reduction is defined as methods that minimise the number of animals used per experiment or study in a manner that is consistent with the scientific aims. It focuses on ensuring experiments provide data that are reliable and reproducible by the use of robust experimental design and appropriate statistical analysis. Reduction also includes technologies that allow the use of fewer animals or for more information to be gained from the same number of animals. It is important to ensure that this reduction in numbers does not have a detrimental impact on the welfare of the animals used. In the following case study, Dr Claire Gibson describes how she has reduced her use of mice in stroke research. Current stroke models rely on blocking and restoration of blood flow through a group of blood vessels that differ greatly in shape and size between animals. These differences lead to variations in the severity of the stroke induced and the data obtained for each mouse. Dr Gibson has minimised this experimental variability by modifying the procedure to restore a more consistent blood flow via the carotid artery. Used alongside imaging techniques that allow longitudinal data to be gathered from each animal, she has reduced the number of mice used in a typical experiment from 58 to 35 without compromising the reliability of the results. In the UK, stroke is a leading cause of both death and disability, and there really are limited treatment options available for stroke patients. So there really is a critical need to develop new treatment strategies for patients, and a lot of this research does rely on animal models. However, the animal models have certain limitations. So in particular, they're associated with large variability in the various outcome measures, and they also have a impact on the animal's well-being as well. We found that there was a reduction in the variability associated with the lesion volume, 
following our new approach. And actually, when we did a power analysis, we showed that there was a twofold reduction required in the number of animals that would be needed, for example, if you were doing a drug study, in order to be able to test a possible therapeutic effect of a new candidate drug. Traditionally, we would measure lesion volume using post-mortem tissue and subsequent histological analysis. However, we've recently started to incorporate preclinical MRI scanning into our stroke studies. This enables us to measure the lesion volume in the stroke animals, but also enables those same animals to be included, for example, in behavioural studies. So what this means, in effect, is that you can gain a lot more of experimental data from the same animals. Thinking about reduction is an essential component of planning any animal study. While there are a range of technologies available to use, as highlighted by Dr Gibson, ensuring that animal studies are properly designed is critical to providing meaningful data. Although it might sound rather obvious to ensure that animal experiments are properly designed and analysed, evidence suggests that this is not always the case. When planning your own experiments, it is important to ask. Is the experimental design robust? Is it adequately powered to detect an effect of importance? And is unexplained variability kept to a minimum? Be aware that using too small a sample size can lead to inconclusive results, wasting the animals involved. You should consult a statistician or use the online experimental design assistant, which was developed by the NC3Rs. This gives tailored advice on experimental plans and on selecting the appropriate analysis method. It is important to regularly evaluate whether there are new technologies that allow more efficient use of animals without unduly impacting on their welfare. Recent examples of this include taking microsamples of blood rather than the larger blood volumes that are commonly taken. More broadly, careful colony management of genetically altered lines can ensure that surplus animals aren't produced. Remember, there is also much that can be done even after a study has been completed to avoid unnecessary animal use. This includes publishing all results, including negative or null findings, and ensuring samples, data and animals are made available to other scientists. Refinements are methods that minimise the pain, suffering, distress or lasting harm that may be experienced by animals and which improve their welfare. Refinement applies to all aspects of animal use, from housing and husbandry to the scientific procedures performed. Refinement can also have an impact on the reliability and repeatability of scientific findings because causing an animal pain or distress not only compromises its welfare but can also alter its behaviour, physiology and immunology. Such changes can increase the variability between animals and necessitate the use of larger group sizes. In the following case study, Dr. Mike Emerson describes the refinement of a mouse model of platelet function, which avoids the use of painful procedures. The traditional approach involves severe suffering for the mice, and Dr. Emerson has refined this by using anaesthetised instead of conscious animals. By tracking labelled platelets rather than the formation of emboli, the new approach allows real-time analysis of platelet function and has the added benefit of allowing more data collection from each animal, reducing the total number of mice per experiment from 200 to 30. My research focuses on platelet function and the reason that I'm interested in platelets is because they are central to conditions such as heart attack and stroke. Now a lot of the time when we work with platelets we're able to work with human platelets which are really easy to obtain from a blood donor. However, to completely understand the disease process we need to think about the whole organism and that involves working with animals. One of the major techniques that's been used in the field involves injection of platelet agonists into conscious animals and the induction of death, which is used as an endpoint. Now that causes considerable pain and suffering and also involves the use of large numbers of animals.
With NC3R's funding, we've been able to refine this technique to one that is conducted in anaesthetized animals, does not induce pain or suffering because it uses real-time monitoring techniques rather than death, and has led to a reduction in mouse use of about 85% in a real experimental setting. In addition, this technique has scientific advantages which have allowed us to investigate, for example, the links between cardiovascular health and exposure to pollution. Currently, we are working to publish our work and to develop more simplistic approaches that allow the model to be more widely used. So we're also working to disseminate our findings amongst the research community. Thinking about refinement is an essential component of both the planning and conduct of animal experiments. Regular discussion with your veterinarians and animal care staff helps to ensure that every opportunity is taken to minimise pain, suffering or distress and improve animal welfare. Establishing and reviewing humane endpoints can make a big difference. It is important to ask whether it's possible to intervene earlier to minimise animal suffering without compromising the scientific objectives. Improving the housing and husbandry of animals under your care, for example through effective environmental enrichment, is often the simplest way to improve welfare. Refinements like those described by Dr Emerson are animal model specific. Others can apply to a range of models, protocols and procedures. For example, research has shown that picking up mice by their tail induces aversion to the handler and causes high anxiety levels in the animals. This can be minimised by instead using a tunnel or cupped hand. The research also shows that picking up by the tail can have an impact on scientific outcomes, including physiological parameters and behaviour. Help on how to put the 3Rs into practice is available from the NC3Rs. The NC3Rs is a scientific organisation established by the UK government to work with scientists and others to discover and implement new 3Rs approaches. The NC3Rs collaborates with organisations from across the life sciences sector, nationally and internationally, including universities, the pharmaceutical, chemical and consumer product industries, and regulatory authorities. Resources available from the NC3Rs include guidance on the latest 3Rs advances through publications, its website and newsletter, regular symposia and workshops, and training materials. It has a range of funding schemes from project grants to fellowships to support the development of 3Rs approaches and early career training. It also funds collaborations between academia and industry and the commercialisation of 3Rs technologies through its Crackit Open Innovation Programme. For further information on the NC3Rs and the ways it can support you and your research, visit the website and sign up to the newsletter.